All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Erica Madden, and I am the executive director of Launch LKN. I really appreciate you guys being here tonight. This is our finale of the Infinite Possibilities series this year, but um, we're excited to tell you that we'll continue it again next year. We've had a lot of fun putting together these events and selecting topics that we hope you have found interesting. Um, I will give you a few more details about tonight's presentation, but first I want to introduce our board chair and co-founder of Launch LKN, Mark McDowell. Um, Mark is what I call a big idea guy. Usually the biggest ideas come over drinks, which is why you always have craft beer in your hands when we come here. Um, but he's really the brainchild behind Launch LKN. He, um, he's the one who pulled people together and said, hey, how do we fix what I see as a problem? There's a lot of people in this area who have great ideas. There's a lot of entrepreneurs and there's a lot of people who have expertise to share mentorship. And we think there's a lot of people who are interested in these kind of tech topics. And so what do we do about it? Um, so Launch LKN is, has happened because of that. Um, and there's a lot of kind of perfect timing things that have gone on this past year um, that have enabled us to get to where we are in this building, having these events on a regular basis. So um, I'm gonna introduce him so he can give you a little update on where we've been and where we're headed. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, if there's anybody who wants a seat, there are plenty up front. Um, Hey, I just want to talk for a few minutes and give a little context about Launch LKN and how we got here. Um, part of the way we got here was through some sponsors, and I want to recognize them with a shout out here tonight, too. And then uh, spend most of my time talking about what we're going to try to do next year and um, try to get the juices flowing. Uh, Eric is right. I, I feel like I was like many people in the area. Um, I was driving into Charlotte uh, for, for, ne for networking events to meet other techies. I moved here in 05, so for 10 years, I didn't do it very regularly, and I found that I could almost always think of an excuse not to go to Charlotte, but there were some, there were some good events in town. But then I would meet people up in the Lake Norman area who were really interesting, who were founders, or, or uh, angel investors, or mentors, and, um, but we didn't know each other. And, and I found out there were these little pockets of relationships, but they weren't connected. And, I remember sitting down with Chris and John Bogiano maybe two years ago, and we said, let's just have an event where we, we advertise by word of mouth, we'll provide free beer, and let's just see who comes. And it was, uh, we had it at the Cornelius Draft House, and something like 75 people showed up. And we got emboldened because we realized we actually have a pretty good community of our own in this area, and we don't have to go struggle on 77 to do some networking. Um, but then we, we got to the question of, well, what are we really going to do? Because the world doesn't just need another networking group. And none of us really had that aspiration. We wanted to try to build something that was meaningful. Um, but we also didn't want to dictate it. We didn't want to say, oh, we're going we're to run a, a startup accelerator, or we're going to create an investment fund. We, we, did, we didn't want to dictate what we did. We wanted to bring people together in a casual environment and see what kind of ideas sprouted. And that, that's kind of been our guiding philosophy. It still is to this day. Um, we said that last year was our, our year to crawl, and this year has been our year to walk, and next year we're debating whether it's run. Some people have said jog, but it's gonna be at a better clip than, than it was this year. Our crawl year was really uh, just about socializing and getting people together and putting out the word, and we consumed quite a bit of local craft beer in 2017. That's also the year that we started working seriously with Davidson College um, about what this space might be. This space was a, was a cavernous, empty, abandoned uh, mill uh, that the baseball team had been practicing in during bad weather. And uh, we sort of said, hey, we think the Launch LKN community could bring um, the mentors if the college can bring the students. And so that was the beginning of a, of a good relationship that's, I mean, now look around you, it's kind of miraculous how quickly it happened. But 2018, we decided, was our walk here, and we decided that in addition to the uh, social events, and every other month, we would pick some really beefy uh, technical topic, and we would find local experts to speak on those topics. And I gave Erica a list of impossibly complex topics with no idea whether we had any local talent. Uh, we covered everything from green energy and battery technology, blockchain, AI and machine learning, smart cities, 
in virtual reality and augmented reality. We had fantastic speakers on every topic, and it kind of made the hair on the back of our neck stand up that we have so much talent, I mean world-class talent, that kind of hides up here around Lake Norman. Um, and, and, and it encouraged us to do the same thing next year. So I have a really, I've got an incredibly challenging list for next year I haven't even shared with Erica, but I think I really want to see us do something on quantum computing, and let's try to understand what's going on with quantum. Um, and I'm also very interested in what's happening with uh, new neural interfaces where you can actually use the brain to control, uh, say, a prosthetic limb or a device. It's amazing. You can tap into nerves and control external devices. So that's just a sneak peek. I don't know where we're going to find the experts, but I now believe that any topic we can find the experts in this area. So one of the things that emerged was that on some of these topics, these topics are open, we call it infinite possibilities, they're open to the community at large. We have, we have retirees and we have high school kids, and we have a whole community. Some of them, uh, some of the topics uh, engender uh, a higher level of passion, and we find that there's groups that want to that want to go deeper than we can do in one night. And so we've had these interest groups form up. And uh, uh, in in 2018, we kind of formally recognized two different interest groups. One that was uh, um, an AI and machine learning interest group that was started by Felipe Lohair, but I think he's not here tonight. And, but um, Although the beauty of, of, of that interest group is that it's self-sustaining now, even when Felipe can't come. Uh, they, had, they had been organized prior to the formation of Launch LKN, but we said, hey guys, quit meeting at Summit and get over here and meet <laughs> at the Hub and become part of Launch LKN, and they agreed to do that. That's probably something like 30 people-ish that meets every week. Um, we had another interest group that emerged in the blockchain area, um, and it wasn't really to trade Bitcoin, um, thank goodness, because that probably wouldn't have ended, out, ended up too well, at least so far. But it was to explore blockchain technology. Um, the main focus tonight is to, uh, to go deep on these two interest groups and let them explain what they're doing. For next year, we would like to have one or two more interest groups emerge. We're not going to dictate what they have to be. We kind of want to see what the community comes up with. Um, there has been some rumblings about a virtual reality interest group, so that's a possibility. Um, one other thing that we're hoping will happen is that some of these interest groups and some of the people involved may start to spawn actual startup companies. Because the interest groups themselves are not intended to be companies, they're intended to be uh, learning experiences. And I'll say more about them in a second. But it would be nice if some of them planted the seeds of some new companies. And that then I think we would come full circle, where we actually we brought mentors and entrepreneurs together, we created a fertile environment, and then we actually had some green shoots come up from that environment. Um, all of this was possible because there were a few local businesses and organizations uh, that took a flyer on us before this building was built and before we, we really knew what the crawl, walk, run stages were. And I just want to thank them and um, encourage you guys to reach out to them because they're here in the room with us. They are entrepreneurs or people who care about the entrepreneurial ecosystem just like we do. Um, let me start with the NC Idea Foundation. And I see, I see Greg Brown over here. Um, the NC Idea Foundation does a lot for entrepreneurs statewide. Greg is on the board of the foundation, and I think he's kind of the Charlotte. Are you the only Charlotte representative there? Oh, Walt is too. Walt is too. Um, uh, about, this, about a year ago, we asked them to fund our lecture series. Um, this Infinite Possibilities lecture series, and they gave us a really quick yes, and it, it made the whole year possible for us. Uh, Greg, Greg is on the board there. He lives in the area. He lives in Uptown. Uh, Greg is also the executive director of the Charlotte Angel Fund as well, and he runs his own uh, uh, fractional CFO service called Cardinal Finance. So Greg is, is uh, as steeped in the Charlotte startup ecosystem as, as anybody you'll meet in the area. And Greg, we really appreciate you guys saying yes to us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in no particular order, I, I, I want to just, I'll jump over to uh, Andy Jones. Um, stand up, Andy. Uh, he's six foot nine. Um, <laughs> he is the tallest lawyer. He's the tallest lawyer in Charlotte. Uh, I don't know if he's the most expensive lawyer in Charlotte. <laughs> Certainly not. 
Um, Andy is, is a, he's a partner with the Forest Firm. He's opening up their Charlotte office here. Um, he's also a Davidson grad, so uh, hopefully we'll see a lot of him around here. Uh, the Forest Firm uh, is, a, is a, I'll say, a smaller boutique law firm that has a special focus area on helping startups um, with their startup matters, from fundraising to corporate structuring and I think some intellectual property. They have a pretty unique program where they charge a low flat rate and just handle any, uh, basically any legal matters that a startup has. I won't go into the details, but I hope you'll see Andy and, and, and the Forest Firm is, is going to be a fixture around here next year. Thank you very much for your support and for saying yes to us, especially at the time. I think the yes came from, uh, when, when I came from somebody in Raleigh, I think. It, it really took a flyer on what we were doing over here. Um, uh, Mark Mahoney. Um, Mark is the founder of, of uh, Jackrabbit Technologies. Um, probably most of you have encountered his software, even if you don't know it. But uh, Jackrabbit is a software company that makes special software for um, for classes like uh, gym, like for gymnastics classes, dances, and other I say other event type classes that allow scheduling and communication and payments and registration and have I left out any of the major? Um, I, I, I knew they were a successful local company, uh, but I went and did my homework and I see they're in over 12,000 schools in every state in the country and they're in 28 countries. So sometime during 2019, I would like to shine a spotlight on Jackrabbit, maybe have you tell us a story about how you built that company. Mike. Um, I hope the two of you will do that. And the other thing, the other fun fact is, Mark, evidently you were a very serious gymnast at one point. You probably still are, so. Um, um, <clears throat> and um, finally, Aquesta. Where's Trey? Yeah, oh, hey. Uh, Trey Weir is the chief banking officer for Aquesta. Um, Aquesta is a local startup. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not doing. Uh, uh, quantum computing that I'm aware of, but Aquesta was founded in 2006 by Jim Engel, who's a neighbor and friend of mine. I think someone from Aquesta has been to every one of our events. Um, we also deeply appreciate you guys saying yes to us. Aquesta is, is not only a startup in this area, they're the only community bank founded and, and headquartered here in Mecklenburg County. Um, they are part of this community. They are lending to individuals and they are lending to businesses. And, and the money that they're lending comes from the deposits that they get. And so uh, I hope that all of you, whether it's from a business standpoint or a personal standpoint, will think about supporting the local entrepreneurial bank that we have here. So Erica, have I hit everybody? Um, my sincere thanks to all of you. We really appreciate you believing in us. Um, we don't really know what the future holds. We have an idea of what 2019 holds. Um, but what I love about our sponsors is they said, hey, we just trust this group. Do, just keep doing cool things. And uh, we really appreciate it. Do I have a, a few more minutes? Or? Um, yeah, so a few things that we want to do in 2019. We really want to see these interest groups thrive. And as I say, we're hoping that one or two viable interest groups will, will emerge. We are in the process of putting together sort of a you know, sort of a little bit of a playbook on what does an interest group have to have to be sort of officially recognized. It's got to have a certain number of people and a certain mission and so forth. But the interest groups are really groups that meet outside of the regular program and they're really about teaching. Uh, what I've learned, and I think Felipe kind of pioneered this with the AI group, every single meeting somebody different teaches the whole rest of the group. So you're either a student or a teacher every single week when you meet. Um, and the idea is to explore, to ask questions, and to learn. These interest groups are not just for techies. They tend to be technical topics because that's kind of our, the binding glue around here. But every one of these interest groups needs um, communicators. They need people with marketing talent. They need people with web design skills. So uh, I worry that there might be some people in the community who have a real interest, say, in AI, but they say, well, I don't have any I don't have a PhD in AI. I can't go join the interest group. Wrong. They need you. So if you have an interest and you, and you're, and you want to learn, come to the interest groups. You'll find them very welcoming. 
One of the other things that we want to do next year is we want to take our, our mentor network and we want to formalize it a little bit. We have probably in the neighborhood of 100 mentors in Lon Shell KN. And a mentor is, is pretty broadly defined. In some cases, mentors are, are entrepreneurs themselves. But in other cases, they are, they are former, you know, they're cashed out entrepreneurs, or they're former business execs, or they're retired or semi-retired, but they have a strong desire to mentor and coach uh, and get young companies standing. Uh, in some cases, mentors will invest. In some cases, they'll join a board or an advisory board. In other cases, they can open up their Rolodex. Um, the problem with our mentor network is that um, it, we all get together and drink excellent craft beer, but we don't have a great skills inventory. And when somebody new comes into the group, we don't necessarily know, oh, you need to go and talk to Mark Boomgarten or whatever the case may be. So we want to put more structure around our mentoring program so that mentors can discover one another, founders can discover mentors, and we can make the organization work more efficiently. Um, and I think, I think 2019, that's going to be part of our, of our jog and run in 2019. Um, but I think I've said enough. The real focus of tonight is to, um, to show you what our interest groups have been doing and to have some Q&A. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think he covered quite well what the purpose of our interest groups are, so I won't go into any more detail about that. We'll get started. But I do want to remind you, we use a text message system where you can text your questions. So as you think of them, um, please feel free to send them to us. And as we get finished with the presentations, um, Chris Baggiano is going to be our MC tonight, and he's going to lead us in the Q&A session. The number is over there as well, and I have a couple slides that will come up. But if you want to put it on your phone so you're ready to ask questions, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Ken Burry, who's going to do uh, the first part of the presentation for our AI and machine learning group. I'm pretty excited about what they're doing. They're a really creative bunch of individuals on this, on this team. So I think you all are going to like what they have to tell you. All right, but thank you, everybody. My name's Ken, and uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the autonomous boat project that we're working on in the AI uh, interest group. And uh, it's not going to be very technical. I, mean, we're, I think it's going to be more of a narrative in terms of our story, okay? And so bear with me. Uh, it is uh, an interesting story. And I think we're gonna, you're going to learn a little bit about how teams get together, how they come up with ideas, how things get implemented, how things don't get implemented. So it's a little bit of a story. And, uh, and uh, Felicia is going to be helping me out here, so she'll, she'll be coming up soon. But uh, let me get started with, with our story. Okay, so the journey continues because we're on a, okay, so how do we get started? Well, typically we have chat sessions, we're standing around talking to each other, getting ideas, and guess what? Mark is, is with the group and he says, I got an idea, and he says, uh, so he says, uh, you guys should make an autonomous boat. And uh, obviously, this is an autonomous boat, yeah. Uh, it's, it's actually real. It's the May, what they call the Mayflower, a multi-million dollar autonomous platform, all, all the latest technology and the whole thing. Well, I think that was his idea, how, how we get, get to that idea and everything else, um, I'm going to explain. So. Okay, this is Lake Norman, if you don't recognize it. It's called a shore or a sandbar party.
So, now you got that in you got that idea in your in your mind, okay? So, we uh, Mark, Mark was talking to Felipe and I think Chang at the time, and they basically, basically said, look, we're going to do an uh, uh, autonomous boat project. Why don't you guys go give it a shot? And so Felipe gets a bunch of us together, and we start brainstorming what our project is going to look like. And uh, for example, a bunch of ideas were coming up. Chris, Chris thought autonomous boats would be good for, you know, you've, you've been out on the, 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 the sandbar party a bit too long, you've had a few too many, it'd be nice if your boat could drive you home. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, we, uh, we actually came up with a different idea. We, we had a bunch of ideas on, on the board, and one of them that uh, one of our members came up with and everybody thought was really cool was to solve the problem of, let's say you're out on, at, at this one of these parties and you run out of food. How do you get more food? Well, basically, if you do it now, you have to drive to some place, dock, get off, go to a restaurant, pick up some stuff, get back on. Hopefully the dock is free, that kind of thing. But, and it takes you out of the, takes you out of the, the party. So the idea was to make a uh, little delivery thing. Okay, here we go. Yeah. And uh, the idea was to uh, build a little boat that takes, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. A little boat that moves the, uh, the food order from the shore to the person that requested it. I thought it was pretty cool. And uh, if it, everybody's from this is Trello. We use Trello a lot uh, to, to manage our ideas and our, and our activities and things like that. So here's, here's an actual example. And it says, uh, the team agreed to do the food and drink delivery autonomous, and we called it the locker barge at that time, okay? So you can actually see how we were doing this process, okay? It's, now, all of us are all volunteers. So obviously, uh, a startup is probably a little bit more motivated than uh, an interest group, but we're doing the same things, okay? So there we go. There's the locker barge, okay? And we've got other stuff in terms of what we're going to be doing. And one of the ideas that we were going to split up into different groups. Now, how, how did we do that? Uh, this, uh, does anybody recognize this thing? Any system engineers out here? OK. Uh, this is a block diagram of the systems that are involved with what we determined was our autonomous boat. and so. Uh, if you're into systems engineering, we got activities for you to do in terms of keeping track of all our interfaces and things like that. But uh, let me let me highlight some of the stuff. Uh, our platform, obviously, we have sensors, per, uh, propulsion, and things like that that we came up with ideas in terms of what we were going to need. Uh, so we put together a group that's responsible for this, okay? And uh, then we had, uh, we were thinking about the environment. So we were, uh, in terms of what the weather is like, what the water is like, and so we have some people that are sort of like, okay, we got ideas about that, obstacles and stuff like that, and uh, we actually made some inquiries about the regulations that are, that might apply to an autonomous boat on Lake Norman. So obviously not very technical, but important. Okay. Then we came up with, uh, uh, here's, here's, if there's programmers in here, this is where we would, we actually have some activities going on. And it's the application in the management system for doing the retrieval. So there'd be an app for the person that's on the boat, an app for the person that's managing the uh, loading up the autonomous boat, 
and that kind of thing, okay? So there's an application involved. And then, then we have our AI system. So the idea is that this boat is gonna go from the shore to the customer autonomously, okay? And uh, that is a challenging part. And so we have a whole group that uh, is dedicated to, to working out these problems. And Felicia is one of the leaders of that group. So I'm gonna let her come up and sort of give a little bit of her story. Thank you, Ken. Um, oh, that's fine. Yes, yeah, so I joined the machine learning group about a year ago and started taking some online courses. I'm in a master's program, so I'm a big techie. I try not to talk about the techie stuff. But um, when I talked to Felipe this summer, he was talking about the autonomous boat. And I really was just leaning in and eavesdropping on his conversation. I was like, you know what? I'm taking an autonomous class this summer. Let me just, you know, show up and join. And so I did, and learning a lot, using, um, hopefully my goal is to use the stuff I learned to apply it. So if you're in that space, like I, I am, you learn, you're taking some online classes, you're learning machine learning, um, you like programming, and you're like, I want to apply it while I'm learning, then I encourage you and I invite you to join our AI group. We don't have some meetings. Um, we're still, we haven't done nothing yet because we don't have no data yet. So it's still in its infancy. But, you know, I invite you to come. We have, um, with the help of Stephen Welch, we have gotten a UNCC team. Um, they've created an awesome computer vision project. Oh, no, it's okay. So they created an awesome computer vision project, which will help our autonomous boat um, idea. So basically, you know, like Ken said, we're gonna have a boat on the water, but we need some way for that to um, go to the customer. So how would a boat know that's the customer? So if we was gonna use some hand gestures, like a waving the hand, one hand, or waving the, you know, the other hand, or waving both hands. So that's the computer vision project that the UNCC team is working on, and I'm excited about it. Um, we had a meeting yesterday, and. They told me all the stuff they're doing. It's pretty high tech. They're using neural networks, deep learning, if that's a term you're familiar with. But um, it's going to be pretty good. So that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. Now, I don't know if you, in the invite, how many noticed that there was something mentioned about ice cream? Anybody? Oh, yeah. OK. Well, there we go. We have. This is sort of the interesting part about a, an indigenous group, and people bring their ideas, and if they bring their idea and bring a prototype, it gets on the chart, okay? And so here is an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See what yeah, I have to limit. There you go. One, two, three. Yeah! I got one. <laughs> so, we have the prototype. We have to figure out how to get that on, onto our boat because that is going to be part of our game there. So that uh, concludes our story. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, have we got any questions? No questions. Okay, I'll take questions. Sure. Okay. Okay, we we are working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The question is, uh, uh, how how are we putting this together? Are we are we prototyping things, or do we have funding? And the answer is yes and yes. We have, we're working on prototypes, and uh, have we got a prototype put together? Not quite. Uh, we're looking for people that are more boat oriented than some of us who are more computer oriented. So if, you can, if there's anybody can help out with that. 
but we have some ideas in terms of what that platform is going to look like and what its parameters are for operating and there is a budget that uh, we th we think we can fit into in terms of building that that platform okay uh, I've got the other questions over here hi everyone Chris Bogiano um, uh, one of the uh, launch Alcam folks uh, uh, so what do you think the timeline looks like to have a prototype on the water and I'll just add my own little question to that. Um, like, where are you at right now? Like, what's okay. the current state of things? Yeah, uh, one, of, one of the things that happened was um, uh, we, we sort of had different group, different people that sort of took on the, the platform uh, role. And what happens is, and this is typical of interest groups and things like that, you have people that come into the group and people that leave, okay? And so, we had sort of a bit of that transition kind of thing going on, and so we're actually now I'm in charge of the group, this project, and so I'm trying to refocus us on getting a platform built, and so we're in discussion with different people to, to try to get that, that going. And uh, we, have, we have the concept, we just need to get it, turn it into a physical, uh, system what are the biggest needs you have uh, in terms like what's the you know what, what would help you move things along uh, I would say that if we can if we can get the platform built uh, that would give us one of the things that I think we, we really need is we have to have some successes and right now uh, to have that platform built will bring bring some excitement to the group and pro probably more interest. Uh, we have, a, like I said, our, our plan is there. Executing is is our goal, is our challenge. I would say. Um, how will you deal with pirate attacks to steal the ice cream? <laughs> Technical question, I know. Uh, <laughs> wow, we're going to have to put that one on the uh, requirements list. <laughs> Um, have you thought anything about navigation? Uh, the question here is, can you use lat long data to set a path? Will the boat use a camera system to detect objects? Like, have you thought about just the navigation in general? Will it be vision? Will it be GPS? Will it be a combination of different systems? Okay. Typically, uh, what we're looking at, uh, some of the ideas have been LIDAR, uh, marine radar, uh, definitely uh, optical, uh, GPS. Definitely, for location, that that's pretty much a, a, a requirement. Uh, there will be, uh, uh, oh, what do they call that thing? I just had a brain fade here. Uh, inertial uh, uh, instrumentation, so that basically picking up, basically the, the same kind of thing that can actually do AI, I mean, uh, uh, virtual reality kind of stuff. So pretty much the same technology, integrating it all together. Yep. Uh, I actually saw something just the other day that I made it a point to look up uh, a couple hours ago, but they're uh, in 2014, so at this point it's pretty dated technology as far as AI goes, but uh, in 2014 there <laughs> someone made a cart that had a fish tank on top, and in the fish tank was a goldfish. And on top of that was a camera looking down on the goldfish, and the camera would recognize where the goldfish was swimming, and it would steer the cart in the direction of uh, of wherever it wanted to go. So I thought there might be an opportunity for you to incorporate that when I saw the headline. Uh, incorporate that here. <laughs> uh, we're we're running out of space. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, on to the real question: uh, What types of regulatory considerations are being taken? What if a police boat needs to flag the AI boat down or pull it over? <laughs> Okay, we, we just have a new requirement. Uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, typically typically anything under ten, uh, ten horsepower is unregulated in North Carolina, so uh, they probably look at it and go, looks like somebody's stray bumper boat. So, uh, but it's a good question though. This is a question for Felicia. Like, how uh, how is this project integrated with your academic studies, if you want to elaborate oh, yes, on. And I don't greatly. know if you want to elaborate on what you're studying specifically. Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, 
I'm a student at uh, the online, at Georgia Tech. They have an online master's of computer science program. So I'm very interested in data science. That's why I got, I'm trying to get my master's. And a lot of the courses is data science related for a computer science program. But, um, so I'm learning all these machine models and algorithms. And I'm like, know how to do it on paper and on code, but how you do it in real life. So um, that's why I want to know how to, you know, apply it, get it done. It, and it's harder than when you do it for a project. It's not, <laughs> it's not the same when you like try to actually apply it. Well, for me it is. So um, that's the, that's my motivation for it. So the classes, I took a data analytics class um, last fall. That really had to deal with, uh, was it linear regression and logistics regression. Um, this summer, I took a AI for robotics class that talked about localization and mapping, um, other stuff <laughs> that I could hardly remember. It talked about robotics, so basically how to move a robot within a space. Um, we really. The class was all software driven, so it wasn't like hands on. I wasn't in the lab to actually apply any of the stuff I learned. Um, this semester, I'm, ta I'm only taking one class at a time because I'm a full, I work full time. So this semester, I'm taking machine learning for trading. Um, if anybody in finance and stocks, it's really, I'm learning a lot. I know how to short and sell and buy and <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, so you're applying machine learning to trade stocks. Um, like I have a project now, if anybody know about Q-learning, um, using Q-learning to trade a stock and optimize your portfolio. So yeah. I think the market did good today, so well done. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was standing in the back listening to your presentation is that if you listen to any K through 12 stuff, if you have children in school, you may have heard the term project-based learning. And typically, school is broken down into math and reading and all the typical subjects that you're familiar with. But project-based learning is the idea that if you have a child synthesize all of those topics into an actual project, they end up comprehending them much better in the end. And this is just the adult version of that, which is a great way to learn uh, machine learning. Um, so I don't know if you have a comment on that, but the next question, and I, I know a little bit, uh, uh, or I, he I heard a little bit of backstory, but um, how did you end up on ice cream as the, uh, as the topic, and do you worry about, or as the food you're delivering, and do you worry about it getting sloppy was the, uh, the concern? Yeah, we, we, uh, the, the ice cream is more of a marketing ploy uh, so, what's that? Pitch <laughs> to beer, shooting beer cans. Okay, that that might have a more li liability issue than shooting ice creams. So uh, yeah, I think that is. Is there any more questions? Or are we good? Uh, there was a. Uh, let me see. How how do you do? You have any vision on how you're going to power it yet? Oh yes. Um, yeah, the, the, there's there's been quite a few ideas. Uh, one original idea was uh, air, like an airboat, put a fan on, and this was sort of a copy of an idea that we saw from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, you, they they have a autonomous boat project. Uh, then we started looking at. Uh, uh, we still want to keep it safe because if you look at that video, we got people in the water and the whole thing. So we're looking at a jet boat kind of propulsion system now. So imagine, imagine a, a Roomba on water. OK, so it's that kind of flexibility, OK? I think people did imagine that, because there's a few questions aligned with, uh, could it sample for pol uh, coal ash pollution contamination, uh, let people know about bad weather, or uh, trim the invasive plant that's uh, whatever that, yeah, the hydrella. hydrella. Yeah. Yeah. That, the, I'd recommend looking up the uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, people. They've done very, they, their projects have been going for I don't know how many years, but they have similar ideas. They've been over overseas doing uh, water uh, quality work and things like that. So putting one of these uh, to work uh, identifying wildlife, taking pictures of wildlife and things like that, and just 
uh, one of their projects was actually just to map the bottom of the uh, the lakes that they were in to, to get an idea of depth and that kind of thing. So there's a whole bunch of ideas that this project could be used for. Yep. There's uh, there's uh, several different questions um, that I'll sum up into one, and, and I'll actually answer it. It's about uh, have you assessed if there's customer need? And I don't think that's the point of this. I think that the point of this is just to do it for the sake of doing it, uh, which is how a lot of hobbies are. So I don't think anyone in this has a commercial objective in mind. Now, as Mark said, not to say that a commercial a startup couldn't come out of something like this, but at its start, it's just pursuing something purely for the sake of doing it, um, which... That's right. well, at some point, there will be. Now, Chris may disagree with me on this, but uh, <laughs> yeah. um, actually, he may morph it into something else, and you guys may have talked about that. Yeah, actually, Chris is leading up the, the, the business side of things, so uh, he's got some ideas in terms of where, we've, where we can go. Uh, a couple other questions I'm sort of encapsulating into one. Have you been, uh, has anyone received your idea positively or negatively? Has anyone been threatened by it or been concerned or been overly enthusiastic? Uh, I would say that we're probably on the enthusiastic side. If you haven't had anybody that sort of goes, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, do you think we should be doing this? I think so. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. I think we've grilled you here, so we'll, uh, we'll let you down off the stage. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate your presentation. We'll bring them back in a few months, maybe six, and you'll toss us some ice cream and show us where you are. So expect that we'll get some updates from this group as we move forward. Um, our next group is our blockchain group, and they have an eye towards social goods, so they're people after my own heart, a lover of philanthropy, so um, I'm very excited for them to share um, where they're headed. They are a newer group than the AI machine learning group, so they're in some early stages in their projects as well. Um, and I think MC is going to kick us off, is that right? Hello, how is everyone this evening? I want to welcome you to the Blockchain LKN Labs part of tonight's event. Um, we're actually getting started a little earlier than we expected, um, so that's great. That gives us more time to talk about blockchain. Welcome all. Um, as Erica said, I am MC. Um, current members present are Ricardo and Liz, and we're waiting for Rachel to join us here shortly. That traffic from Huntersville, oi. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I might want to have the clicker. There we go. Okay. So, um, we are a social impact organization. That may not be evident exactly when you, when you think blockchain, you know, cryptocurrency. That's not what we're all about, right? Um, while we will not be launching ice cream sandwiches using AI and ML <laughs> technology, um, a powered boat. Um, we want to impart to you the launch of the blockchain movement. Welcome to the blockchain movement for social impact in the Lake Norman and greater Charlotte area. Our organization, we want to take a moment for a very special thank you. Our organization would not have existed without Mark McDowell and um, his launch LKN chair and Real Ventures partner. Um, in August 2018, Mark, Ricardo, Scott crafted the blockchain LKN Labs Charter, which states that this group consists of a vested group of blockchain experts and enthusiasts who facilitate open conversation and collaboration between professionals, students, academics, humanitarians, NGOs, nonprofits, corporate enterprise, and blockchain startups and projects. Also the BLL mission to accelerate blockchain innovation through a technology for social impact community. Community. 
Let's give them a big round of applause. I'd like to quickly review our agenda for this evening. We have, we've had our intro and welcome, our vision, right? Mission statement, charter. Why blockchain matters, right? Liz will be t speaking to that. Blockchain for social impact. Transforming Charlotte, what can we do? What's the problem? What's the solution? And of course, Q&A. Okay, so this is an involved, right, multi-Venn diagram. I wanna draw your attention to technology for social impact. How are we harnessing blockchain technology? Why are we drawn to it? Blockchain actually has the ability to inject trust in a trustless society. Let me say that again. Blockchain technology has the ability to inject trust in a trustless society. Here we have technology for social impact, anti-human trafficking, missing kids, homelessness, social mobility, all of these different groups that are working using blockchain, using machine learning, community development projects, all of the above. Blockchain LKN Labs is laser focused on liberating Charlotte from Lake Norman, Charlotte, the greater Charlotte area from being number eight out of 19,000 largest US cities for human trafficking crimes. Show of hands, who here knew that that was such a problem in the Lake Norman, in the greater Charlotte area? How many people knew? Okay, roughly half of the room. That came as a complete shock to me to think that my teenager um, would, you know, average age, 13 to 16 years, that's the prime target age for social, I'm sorry, for human trafficking. 50% um, of people trafficked, usually girls, women, are under the age of 16. Charlotte is number eight out of 19,000 U.S. largest cities. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. We and blockchain, uh, blockchain LKN Labs and the greater community at large, we cannot stop, stand by. We refuse to stand by. We want to leverage blockchain, blockchain technology, artificial, learning, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We can use technology to make a difference. So that's what we're planning, what, that's what we're laser focused on today. In 2019, we see a collaboration, a stronger collaboration between AI, machine learning, to create a chatbot, honeypot, honeypot bot, honeybot, whatever you want to call it, to lure sex predators, potential sex predators, into a fake relationship using, um, using that conversation using that transaction log. Oh, put it on a t blockchain, immutable. Immutable evidence of what this person is trying to achieve, how this person is trying to lure an underaged boy, girl, what have you, and possibly trafficking that young person. In 2019 and beyond, blockchain LKN labs could transform food stamps incorporating digital technologies, digital identities for the least of these. To receive what? To receive social services, immutable records, immutable transactions, proving who they are and what they need and what they deserve. Categorical cryptocurrency donations for food, medicine, etc. Where's my money going? Is it making an impact? The answer could be yes, could be trackable through blockchain technology. More to the point, we can give our veterans, we can give our aged out foster youth, our mentally ill citizens, better tools by which to be visible in society. If you don't have records, if you don't have an ability to prove who you are, you tend to be invisible in a given society. We cannot stand by and let this happen. So why did I join Blockchain LKN Labs? As a woman of faith, 
business, and technology, I was drawn to its mission. I was drawn to its charter. I could not be one of those per persons who stood by and did nothing when such problems, human trafficking, deplorable, existed. Um, I, I was drawn to the accessibility of the group, the open nature of the group, open conversation. Recall back to the labs charter that we are facilitating open conversation among multiple groups of people to solve the challenges at large. I want to thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy our presentation, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Oh, I want to, <laughs> so sorry. I want to introduce our next presenter, Liz Escobar. She is a blockchain engineer at Duke Energy. She's going to tell us why blockchain matters. Thank you. Thank you, NC. Well, I want to start with a secret. <laughs> so first, I'm Elizabeth Escobar. Thank you, NC, for introducing me. I am uh, work for Duke Energy. I'm a hyperledger blockchain developer. But I want to tell you a secret. This is the first time I'm presenting to a big group. And I don't know, it's a great introduction and opening from Mark, MC's introduction, the great presentation and energy, or the cocoa butter, uh, cocoa um, IPA I got, but I'm feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I'm here to talk about is why blockchain matter. And, you know, blockchain matter to the point that I joined this blockchain LK Labs. <laughs> it changed my career. Uh, first, I heard about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and someone invited me to this group. I started learning about the technology. I started computer engineering. And once I learned the technology, I said, oh my god, this is going to change the world. It's kind of when you learn about the internet the first time. It was that moment. And I'm here a lot to experience that. And I don't want to miss that. Um, so. Now, I'm here to tell you a little bit more why blockchain should matter to you as well. Um, so please show hands. How many are familiar with what blockchain is? Not really what Bitcoin is, what blockchain is. OK, I see a lot of people are familiar with it. OK. So blockchain is similar to the internet. Somehow you get a lot of computers right interconnected. You're sharing some information on it. However, the way this information is stored, transacted, is very different. Uh, in the blockchain network, you have several computers interconnected. And every person uh, participating in this network, they have some kind of identifier, which we call a private key, someone that is unique to that owner. And every information transacted from that person or individual is attached to that ownership. So uh, one problem we currently have in the internet is that when you attach a file, right, you're going to share it with someone you trust. Every time you share information, whoever you're sharing it with, it has an identical copy of it. So if you're sharing an attachment via email, let's say Gmail, that file you're sharing, you're sharing it with the person is your recipient, but at the same time, that Gmail server, when you're storing your emails, is having a full copy of it. And then someone could take that information, leak it, someone could hack it, or someone can manipulate that data, and you not even will know. They have an identical copy of it. So that's why there's so many regulations and so many privacy issues with our current internet like Facebook with Analytica. They have all your photos, private information, and they can go and use it. And sometimes we don't even know what is happening with it, right? That's why blockchain is a new evolution of the internet. If this will run on the blockchain, there is a record. You're sharing some information with somebody. However, no one can modify the data. Only the owner, which could be you with your private key, or perhaps your recipient who have access to the data, no one else. They don't have a copy of it, right? There's a record that is immutable. Why? Because there are cryptographic algorithms, mathematical formulas, and making sure that that information cannot be corrupted or modified, modified by any central authority. So blockchain is completely decentralized. What that means? Yeah, I, I have money, right? So I can take my dollars, change it to some cryptocurrency. If I want to 
send some money to someone else around the world, right? I don't need to go to a central bank, show three forms of ID, pay a deposit, and also make sure that bank has a bank that is affiliated within that country when I'm gonna send that money. I can just do it in cryptocurrency with a digital wallet. I know that other person I'm sending the money has a digital wallet, I just need to know what it is. Then there will be a validation across those nodes in the network, making sure, okay, she's sending this money to this person, to this address. Only that person can access that money. And then there will be a record across all the nodes on the network that record, okay, Elizabeth sent this amount of cryptocurrency. And from then on, that person can claim that money wherever they are. They don't need to have a bank. They don't need to hold, show three forms of ID. Anybody can participate on it which make it more secure, because if you have all the information in one place, someone can just hack that and then get access to it. In the blockchain network, a malicious actor will need to hack over 51%, if we're talking about Bitcoin, over 51% of those devices across the network in the time I'm making that transaction uh, validation, which could be 10 minutes. So now imagine you have 10,000 devices across the world. Is it easy? for one person to hack 10,000, well, I guess over 5,000 devices in less than 10 minutes, it's not easy. That's what Bitcoin it is, and it's been 10 years, and it still has not been hacked. So a transaction that could take days, now could take just seconds to minutes. Now you don't have to deal with a lot of intermediaries and fees. There's a lot of security on it. Uh, decentralization, as I mentioned, so the data cannot be corrupted, immutable, that's why blockchain mattered to me when I learned about the technology. Now I want to share with you about some pros and cons, because nothing is perfect in the world, right? So some pros, as I mentioned, um, when you are sharing information transactions in the blockchain network is that it is transparent. It means that across all those devices that are recording that transaction that took place, anybody can verify the history of the transaction. So once something goes in the blockchain, it's there forever. Uh, it's immutable, so that record will not change over time. Uh, it is more secure. Uh, at the same time, um, it is persistent. So it means if one of those devices in my network goes down, it doesn't mean the blockchain network goes down. No, there will be other devices in the network, and once a device reconnects on the network, it will get an updated list of all the transactions that took place. So you cannot really take down the blockchain network. It's not like, oh, the internet went down. No, that's not possible in the blockchain network. Um, transactions are irreversible. That's positive and negative, right? If you're talking about voting, right? Once you submit your vote, you don't want the vote to change. You don't want the Russian hackers to go and change your vote, right? You want that to stay the same. And it is irreversible. In that case, it's positive. Um, at the same time, it's negative because it's, uh, it depends on your use case. If you're talking about cash and you meant to pay 20 and by mistake you pay with a $100 bill, well, guess what? You pay with a $100 bill, it's gone, right? Uh, so it is irreversible. Um, as I mentioned, it can be positive or negative depending on your use case. Um, one uh, difference is that since there's no centralization and you have all these devices validating transactions using mathematical formulas, cryptography, there's some process in there. So it might not be as fast as if you will have only one single authority validating transactions. And for Bitcoin, for example, it can run 10 to 15, 15 transactions per second, which for uh, Visa, you know, you can run like hundreds of thousands of transactions depending on, on your system. Um, that's why the blockchain has evolved. So you can find some cryptocurrencies that allow you to have hundreds and thousands of transactions per second. Uh, but this is just an example how blockchain started it with Bitcoin. And, and in this case, that was uh, a comp that the performance might not be as fast. However, this technology is evolving. Here are some examples. So 
how can I use blockchain, right? Uh, as I mentioned, you can use it for exchanging money across the world. So for example, you want to send money to someone in Russia, you no longer carry the US, doesn't have financial institutions in Russia, you can send it anywhere in the world, even if those countries are banning some of the institutions here in the US. It doesn't matter for the blockchain network. You can do it in seconds. Uh, in fact, uh, Wells Fargo and some other banks, they have consortiums now uh, where they have all these banks across the world in a blockchain network, so transactions uh, that are international can take just seconds to minutes to reconciliate that rather than, men, uh, than days. Um, and the use case for that is that there was so much fraud on these financial transactions because sometimes they would take days. So let's say you're chain, uh, trying to send like a million dollars from some country when they say there's a lot of intermediaries. That person could say, I send a million dollars, go and buy a house for a million dollars after made that transaction, and because it would take so many hours to reconciliate, they wouldn't find out about the fraud after that person already purchased some goods. So just by the problem the blockchain is solving, they're using it now. And you can read uh, about several consortiums from banks on this use case. Another use case is the centralized apps. Many companies spend thousands of dollars uh, buying cloud uh, services just to make sure they don't have any downtime because that's negative. That's not a good user experience, right? And for some companies, that can mean millions of dollars. Let's think of Amazon, for example. Right now, the Ethereum virtual machine has uh, several computers across the world, like uh, one world computer. And you can deploy your application using this blockchain network that will never go down because there's not a single point of failure. So that's another use case. Um, another problem blockchain can solve is right now our problem with our domain letters, right? <laughs> There's a record, you don't know from which farm you have it. I remember I went to see my fiance's family in DC and they're going to bake the turkey. And we're like, oh, I think that brand just have a recall on the turkey. Now we don't know if we have turkey from Thanksgiving. <laughs> so <laughs> how can you solve that problem? And actually blockchain can solve that. So Walmart is partnering with IBM so they can track your food provenance. So what they do, they set up, let's say, a barcode. Your uh, lettuce came from a farm. Then they will add that record to the blockchain with a barcode. And then every time a distributor or any other party get access to that lettuce, for example, that record will be updated. And because blockchain is accessible to anybody, then if you get these letters, you can use a mobile app and just scan your code and you can find out exactly from which far it came, all the points where these letters went through and there is, there's a recall, you can quickly see that. That's another use case for blockchain. As I mentioned, it's immutable, so you can use it for secure online voting. Now there are some applications using blockchain for that. And uh, the other part of it is censorship resistant. And when we talk about freedom, freedom of speech, you know, our liberties, uh, now this is so important because in some countries, um, you cannot really say anything against the government. Now, in blockchain, you can actually create articles and then deploy the information on the blockchain network and it protects your identity. You don't need to show your social security or who you are to join the blockchain network and share an article. Anybody can join the blockchain network. Uh, so Estine, for example, is a platform um, for social media sharing. You can blog, create articles, content. You can be required to some cryptocurrency. Uh, but at the same time, it's deploying this information on the blockchain network, so it doesn't matter if the government or the laws up there, this information cannot be taken down if, let's say, the government doesn't agree with it. Um, now, uh, I want to make a comparison between the internet and, and the blockchain network. I kind of talk about how blockchain is solving several problems that now we're seeing with the internet, like regarding privacy, um, regarding security, um, and, and points of failure, right? When you have centralization, you have single points of failure. And when the internet started in the 1960s, um, really it took many years to kind of monetize the value of the internet. Right now we don't we don't even think about it because the top five companies, right, they're internet companies. You think of Amazon, Google, Facebook. Oops, I don't know what happened here. Go ahead, keep 
Okay. Um, well, it's, it's kind of important what I was going to show in the graphic. Perfect. Yay! Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Our tech is for Erica. <laughs> yes. So if you look at this graphic, uh, it really took over 50 years to see the value of, of like the internet, you know, to have this almost trillion dollar companies. But blockchain so far is just 10 years old. And we already have over 10,000 nodes around the world. And at some point, even blockchain, well, Bitcoin is one example of it. Uh, Bitcoin has over 10,000 nodes. And at some point, it even reached a valuation close to trillion dollars now. It's a lot lower than that. Uh, but there are some startup projects, um, blockchain projects, that have even hit valuations higher than that. And now, this is not a disclaimer to go and invest in crypto. It's kind of just to show you that even though the technology is just so like kind of infinite in evolving it's already proven the value so that's why i think blockchain matters because it's solving so many issues we currently have and at the same time despite um the earliest stage in which it is and that is still evolving it's not mature and fully adopted it still has proven its value um, now, I would like to hand it over to Rachel, and she will share about the social impact that blockchain can have. Thank you. Thank you. I made it. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Rachel, and thank you, Liz. I always learn so much from you. And uh, first thing, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, apologize for coming right at the last minute. But um, my role in the group is a non-technical one. So I'm going to kind of take you down um, a little bit of a journey that I've been taken on by this wonderful group, um, you know, with Melissa and with Cardo and everyone who, who's been joining us. Um, what brought me to the, the Blockchain LKM Labs group is my interest in social impact. In particular, I am not a technologist, but I'm extremely fascinated and learning as fast as I can about it, about the blockchain. But my main interest is I am a teacher. I was a college teacher for 15 years outside of Chicago. Um, and now I'm currently working on being a Montessori teacher in Huntersville. Um, and the main thing that excites me about being a Montessori teacher and hearing about this technology blockchain is there's so many of the social impact projects that are humanitarian based, both global and local, that reach out to new blockchain technologists to create better solutions. Solutions of, as Liz pointed out, solutions of getting rid of single points of failure, which helps get rid of uh, government corruption, transparency. Um, and as a Montessori teacher, right now I'm teaching six to nine year olds, and that's where I ran from to get here. Um, <laughs> I love them. Um, they're going to be the future, and they should have a say in the goals they want to solve and the technology they might want to use. And if it's going to be a new internet, well, they already know more about the internet than I, I hate to tell their parents, than, than their parents might know. Um, so I think the world is ready for teachers like me. Montessori teachers like me to reach out and realize that education is about preparing our kids for the future, future of prosperity, of security, of transparency, perhaps, um, all these things. So there are literally out there, I don't have the statistics, so I'm still learning, um, but many, 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 at least since a year ago, many um, projects um, with Blockchain for Humanity initiatives throughout the world. Um, a lot of them proposed by the United Nations. Um, so I'll give you just a little bit of introduction to me um, as a Montessori teacher and then make further connections to how this is about social impact projects with the blockchain in particular. Um, so if you don't know anything about the Montessori world of teaching and philosophy, it was uh, created by a woman uh, from Italy named Maria Montessori in the early 1900s, through the mid-1900s, and she survived both world wars and even had to leave Italy. Um, and all the time she was doing that, she was seeking a way to create a system of education that might promote um, better global prosperity and security. So when I think of things like global prosperity and security, wow, that sounds like a lot of things that the social impact projects for the blockchain want to achieve. 
Um, here's one of her quotes. Uh, children are human beings to whom respect is due, superior to us by reason of their innocence and of the greater possibilities of their future. So the last two charts that Liz showed have been kind of on my mind a lot because if indeed the blockchain will become, I think the term is the web 3.0, it will be the next way in which we function kind of as a, um, I think the phrase is a world computer, meaning we make nodes throughout the world to share information, to store information, to protect information. Then I think these, these ideas of the way I teach become very appropriate to the social impact projects that are currently reaching out to make blockchain solutions. Um, we have this view over here. Again, just to, to give you my perspective as a non-technologist, but as an educator, um, every year Montessori schools get to go to the UN and do a model UN. And that's a special relationship to Montessori schools because she was there um, when they first uh, created the first League of Nations that led to the creation of the United Nations. So Montessori schools, indeed, we go right to the General Assembly floor and we have eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds making speeches, passing resolutions, pressing voting buttons, and submitting their proposals. And there's always little budding technologists in every room. And they're saying, where are the white hats? And we got to hack in and you know change the corruption by putting things out there. So I'm pretty sure I don't get to go this year because the kids I'm teaching this year are too young to go. But the years when I taught kids old enough, I'm sure there's going to be little young blockchain enthusiasts at, at this conference that's going to be in the spring. So these sustainable development goals, Youth Impact Forum, Model UN projects for the Montessori schooling system, you know, this says here, take the next step and guide your students to be at the forefront of today's society. So whenever I come to the meetups, I always come to the meetups and I'm like, I got to learn, I got to learn, I got to learn. I got to educate myself because I know pretty much all the kids are going to be running right past me in their knowledge and I'm chasing right after them. And why not chase after them? Because really, um, the, the goal of using blockchain technology for social impact is whether you um, follow the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as their latest initiative, it was released in 2015, one of the years I got to go with my students. It's a series of 17 goals to help the world create programs for sustainable development. There's different themes, but really when you pull out of these themes, you can get, um, um, you can get all these problems, if you want to call them that. And when you look at all these problems, these problems, blockchain use cases are out there already trying to solve these problems. You know. Um, homelessness and poverty just uh, are on my mind a lot because I think about those are the people who can't gain access. They can't even get a bank account. So now with blockchain technology and finances, as, as Liz pointed out, everyone, everyone can participate and if it's an open blockchain, the more people who participate, the stronger it will be. And of course, as a teacher, I just go, yes. Because if more kids participate in my lessons, the class will go better. If more kids just listen and join me, it will be so great. So that's how my week has been going. So, um, But this whole idea, a technology can be a metaphor for what we all need to try to do, perhaps, which is open up our minds to the idea of um, making these these nodes that aren't central, they're decentral, but they create prosperity and security. And that prosperity and security also leads to all kinds of things we could try to solve. Wildlife conservation, anti-corruption through the transparency, sustainable carbon credits. I mean, but all these, we're going to head kind of up to the top because I don't want to go too far down the technological rabbit hole because then I will get a little lost. I try, I try to hang with everybody. Um, but here we see there's this wave of global and local actual projects that have used the blockchain successfully. So here we have one of the UN um, World Food Program proof of concept pro uh, projects that actually it was scalable. Because being scalable, being ethical, being useful, being and able to talk about it is sort of what I try to do. But the World Food Program here for these uh, Syrian refugees who you know, they had to leave their home. They could have lost all their, all their documents, all their rights. And here they are in Jordan, and, and this program was to make sure, well, if they're going to lose all that, we're going to make sure they can get food and we can track it. We can track it on the blockchain. 
Um, and then maybe perhaps more um, local, uh, you know, West Virginia, uh, there was an actual blockchain voter registration that was successful um, with uh, military voting. I think it was absentee military voting. So um, that's pretty exciting. So, so what are we doing with our group here at the Hurt Hub? Um, our, well, we're going to think about how these issues, you know, I, I'm a big believer that the local is global, the global is local. I've always been reaching out to the whole world, whether or not you, you think you need to go solve the whole world's problems, we can at least try to so solve the problem that's with us, where we are. And that's kind of as a teacher, it's always, I got to start here, because they're going to be who knows where. Um, so what are we doing? Oh, not that. Not yet. Um, we're, we're seeking to transform our world by being inspired by all the blockchain. Um, they just had their 73rd conference um, just a few months ago at, in New York, the United Nations, bringing up these goals again. And they had several sessions that were about blockchain initiatives. And if we look, when you go through here, one of the United Nations projects that was a great use case of blockchain technology for social impact was to work with a government, Moldova, and another organization called the World Identity Network. That's what this stands for. Um, working to make a blockchain identity because having your own identity can help prevent probably one of the most horrific things, which is uh, children, um, in particular most horrific, getting uh, basically trafficked. And you might think that this is an issue that in Moldova, one of the poorer countries in Europe, I think, I don't know if it's still the poorest, but that's why it was occurring, because people didn't have access. Children, really, if we think about it, as I'm a teacher, I look at children, you know, think about how often they're not protected. I mean, they're children. We try to, we, as parents or teachers or community, you try to protect them, but wouldn't it be great to make a future where when we, when we look in our own backyards, we try to figure out these, these children, these people that, as a Montessori teacher, we're always talking about we're in the presence of someone who's the next Gandhi or the next president. They're better than us already. So why don't we look at these horrible hotspots for human trafficking and realize this is also about child trafficking. And if the UN initiative reaches out to Moldova to say blockchain's going to make an identity that's immutable, that's um, you know protected, that that will help solve the issue. So then here, we're going to actually um, at this point, you know, my role is kind of to keep the inspiration going, the energy going, being someone who can learn. Um, but I also sit in, in our inspiration for um, our developers because these hotspots kind of inspired the project that I am um, going to turn the mic over now to um, Ricardo. But our actual project, our blockchain um, we're building, is inspired about the identity of uh, protecting child trafficking right here in the Charlotte area. So um, before I hand it over, just thank you all again. And thank you so much to our group for all they've taught me. And um, this is the actual technical side. So at this point, the teacher will hand the mic off. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> One of the first things, before I get into the use case and uh, explain the technology, I, I just want to, you know, this group, when we, when we created it, we we're all about, can we create a gr group that's not just technical, but can we invite people that are non-technical? And Rachel, you know, she's, she's our inspiration because when she joined, we really needed somebody to, to connect with the community because this use case is about creating, uh, leveraging blockchain technology and say, okay, you know what, if the next time our ch a child in this town gets onto a bus, uh, a car, or ride sharing, or a plane, you know, can we do something, can we authenticate them in a way that they're not authenticated today? So, how many of you all traveled for uh, uh, the holidays this past weekend, right? So, who took their kid with them? All right, so what are the two questions that they use to authenticate your child that you provided your driver's license to TSA, but if you, if you had a minor with you, what, what do they ask your kid uh, to validate? Your, yeah, they ask two things. How old are you and your name? And that's it. So one of the reasons why uh, this happens is because we have two major highways here, 77 and uh, 85, and our children are not authenticated. Our children have no real rights. There's, there's no way of being able to say, okay, how do I know you are who, who you are? 
So this, this network and the idea of decentralization and the Not My Kid project started off with the UN and we're saying, okay, how can we do this, how can we do this here? So um, the idea about this is to, and, and why Rachel matters is, can we promote this solution to the local community and work with the PTAs, the soccer moms, and say, you can trust decentralization and blockchain. You can trust it more than you can trust Facebook, Google, because what's happening today? So the issue today is that there's no privacy, there's no trust. Blockchain is all about trust. Blockchain is all about being able to have an immutable record. So we took this idea and said, well, if the UN's doing it, why can't we do it here? And so this particular project is something that we've been working on, and we started researching all the different technologies. So in a space that's brand new, just like when the internet was born, uh, we, st we had uh, identity management technologies back in the mid-90s. And this is my background. I have, I'm a cybersecurity expert. I've been doing identity management and cybersecurity for about 20 years. And the systems that we have today are, even though uh, we've sold, I used to work at Oracle, and we sold millions of dollars of solutions, there's no system out there that is good enough to protect your data. And if you see uh, the issues with social logins and Facebook today, they've proven that when you have a social login or any kind of online identity, how, how many of you actually trust that when you're online that your information is secure? Raise your hands. You trust Google? You trust Facebook? No. So how many of you have listened to Tim Cook? So Tim Cook recently had a, was in front of a large world conference and he said that you know, privacy is a basic human right. And, and he talked about, and his, the people that he probably has dinner with, he called out uh, these huge uh, you know, social media giants, Facebook, Google, because they're using, the words were, they're using our data, our information, and weaponizing it, right? And so today our data is now controlled by us. And the idea of using a blockchain identity is to be able to own your own data. So you should be able to own your data and if, if, if you have any kind of rights to that data, uh, any, any credentials, you should be in control of that. And with this technology, today, for example, when you're in, your credentials, uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, any one of those organizations, they can take away that access in an, in an instant. So what happens if they take away your Facebook or, or Amazon account? The idea of this is creating an identity that nobody can take away from you, that you can control. And so the system of authentication, I'm not going to get too much into it. I'm going to talk about how Sovereign works and why we chose Sovereign. But the idea and why, why we need more community members maybe that are not technical and why do we need more people like Rachel is that part of the, we have two working groups for this project. One's technical. And the other one is we need people that can communicate with the soccer moms, you know, the teachers, and, and, and take them and say, you know what, here's the basics around blockchain and decentralized computing, and this is why you can, try, you can trust this system more than you can trust Facebook. Because initially they'll be like, all right, who's that round fat guy telling me that he's more you know, secure than Facebook? They got billions of dollars, right? And, it's, and, and, and the, the case is, is that if you come to our group and you work with us and you understand the value of this technology and you jump down this rabbit hole, you understand what, you know, the difference between decentralization and centralization and why this type of network, when you register your child with a, a, biomet a biomarker and the only form of identification your child's going to have is their fingerprint. And that fingerprint will be registered with an identity credential on this uh, public uh, blockchain network called Sovereign. And this information is more secure. You, they're not going to store anything on the blockchain. That's a big uh, misconception is that even though these networks are more secure, your personally identifiable data will not be stored on the blockchain. All this particular network does is understands the relationship between you and your information. And you're just a number. Or in this case, you'll be a fingerprint. And, and the way you authenticate is that the banks will work with um, uh, the, these, these different nodes on the blockchain, and uh, any business you, you, you do business with today, the authentication system and how they authenticate will change. And this particular type of uh, network authentication when it comes to identity is this identity management has evolved. You know, I started doing this in the mid-90s, uh, sold millions of dollars of systems. This is the future. And when it comes to banks, right, your relationship with your customer is going to change. They're going to control their identity and their data. You're going to verify their claims or credentials with them, but they're going to be able to control that relationship. Right? And so there's a lot of cost savings in this kind of solution, but 
if we bring it back to here in Charlotte and human trafficking, our goal is, is simple. What the UN said, there's one and a half billion people in the world that have no form of identity, right? And when you have no form of identity, you're invisible to society. And when you're invisible to society, you are, uh, you preyed upon these, these, these human traffickers. It's a $150 billion industry. 96 billion is sex tra trafficking, right? And 70% of those that are sex trafficked are women and children. And we're ranked eighth. And so when I found out about these projects and these initiatives, uh, I jumped down the rabbit hole about two and a half years ago. Uh, I, I was actually running from Oracle and my past as far as identity management, cybersecurity, I want to do something different. But then, like the Don said, it's, blockchain just sucked me back in and I realized that I have all this experience, but now we have a new way of authenticating that's better than it is today. So um, let's talk a little bit about Sovereign and and why in this group. So when we started this uh, group in August, we had about 20 members. Now we're over 100 members. And the purpose of the group, like Mark said, is to research, work with uh, the, the, everybody. And there's no one individual that's in charge. And we said, look, here's our problem. Here's what we want to do. We want to build something that's similar to what the UN did and, um, and prove it and see which one of the different technology vendors out there are the best for this particular use case. We're not saying Sovereign is the best, but for this use case, for protecting our children, minors, and victims of human trafficking, I, in my personal opinion and, and, and of the group, this solution, this technology network, is the best one for us because one of the questions you should ask is like, all right, great slide, Ricardo. So when is this gonna happen? How are you gonna make it work? And one of the beautiful things about Sovereign is that 75% uh, of the work has already been done. That network, that blockchain and network has been, out, has been live for over a year. All we have to do is train our developers, train people in our group uh, to build applications that can do this. So when Alice gets into an Uber and it's the middle of the day uh, and she's in that Uber with evil Uncle Bob, the, she'll get scanned and the mom or the dad will get a notification on her phone and say, hey, is, Alice, is it okay for Alice to be leaving? school and getting into an Uber. And the idea is that this transaction and this system, this network, because the authentication is happening in this manner, will notify Uber and say, hey, stop. We don't know who this evil Uncle Bob is. And this is what traffickers do, right? They put a f the fear of God in our children. And most of the human trafficking that happens happens in underprivileged neighborhoods. You know, they kidnap uh, homeless people, kids that are fostering out. Uh, but for our kids, you know, how many here have teenagers? All right, how many of your teenagers do this all the time with Instagram? That's my daughter. All right, I, I definitely come second to that phone. Um, but her life, you know, and one of the reasons, I, you know, I, I, she's my, my inspiration is that she's the, the um, she's one of the reasons why I do this. You know, Olivia, she's 13. And uh, before it was like, well, what do you do, Dad? You know, and I could never compete with uh, the firemen or the cop, right? Uh, or the teachers, you know, these are the real rock stars. But now she knows that my future and the re what I'll do for the rest of my life will, will be around this, is how can we leverage technology to make a difference? Not just for profit. I mean, we are all about making money and providing for our families, but my child now knows that, yeah, I may not be Superman, but one of the things I do when I ask her, what does dad do for a living? You know, and she says, well, yeah, you can, you, you can potentially protect my, my friends, right? And because Instagram and social media is one of the main um, devices and applications that these sex predators will spend nine months grooming your child and, and, and asking you and, be, and being, being, being their friend, this relationship. And then that one day, because you know, our teenagers always love us and are never mad at us, right? But that one day that your child's upset with you, they'll leave and they'll go to a Starbucks and they'll be gone. Right? And we have, the, unfortunately, the, the, the highway system where they can be gone with a quickness. And there's no system that can authenticate them and stop them. So that was kind of the impetus of all, of all this. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Sovereign and, 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 and educate you on the technology. Um, so Hyperledger, let's start there. So Hyperledger what, is a blockchain uh, technology that was created by IBM. And IBM had, did a brilliant thing where they said, you know, we don't want to own a blockchain and sell the blockchains. We realize that this whole movement is really driven by open source, so we're going to give it away. 
and they gave it to the largest open source uh, organization called the Linux Foundation. And they created the Hyperledger projects. And under Hyperledger, there's a variety of different projects, like Sawtooth, that are different types of blockchains for different types of reasons. Um, there's another one. There's a project called Hyperledger Indie. And so a company by the name of Evernim uh, did the same thing that IBM did, and they created a blockchain for identity management. And they gave it to Hyperledger, knowing that if we give the source code to an open, uh, to a community like this, there'll be the community that will, will, will do free development. And also, it provides you with a way of, of, of governance. So the, so the growth of this particular uh, blockchain and, ha and how we build the software, it's better to, in this particular model for many different reasons. So Sovereign is the, is a, well, I'll tell you what Sovereign is in a, in a minute, but the Hyperledger Indie and Sovereign are the same thing. This is where all the code is managed um, on open source. You can create your own identity, blockchain identity network like Sovereign has done and create, a, a, you know, in Charlotte or wherever with the same code base. So what is Sovereign? So Sovereign is basically a global, a decentralized, self-sovereign identity network for enterprises, developers, uh, that's operated by independent stewards. All right, so what's beautiful about this particular network is that A, it's already built, and, the, and governance is really important when it comes to blockchain is that, so who's driving the policies? You know, how are they developing the code and who's making the rules? Um, because remember, even though Sovereign is a nonprofit foundation, their main goal is, is to really administer this governance framework and make sure that these, that these sovereign um, stewards are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is verifying credentials, all right, and allowing people to create decentralized identities, and they become the nodes on a blockchain network. And so, like I said, this particular network is, is one of the reasons why we chose this, uh, this technology and this particular solution is that when you're, when you're an innovator, when you're in the tech space, you don't want to go and buy something that's based, that's that proprietary, for example, right? Because, you know, eventually uh, it's not going to interoperate. And if you're, cr you're creating a, a global solution, you want to make sure that they, they're, they're based on open standards. Identity management has a, a collection of different uh, protocols that drive the Web 2.0 identity infrastructure, LDAP, uh, SAML, these are protocols that were developed and are run in, in these organizations. So the W3C and the IETF are global organizations that run, that have, that is a standards body. And so HTTP, for example, is a standard that allows you to have for web pages to work, right? SQL is a protocol that's managed uh, that allows your database to be able to communicate with each other. And so in this new world, when we're looking at all the different uh, new blockchain identity vendors, we looked at what were the standards that have been created? Uh, what are the working groups? The Decentralized Identity Foundation, OASIS. OASIS is an old school identity management working group. And, th and this is how standards get, uh, get created. They get created in, in a working group and then they get pushed up to the WC3 or an IETF to become the standard and supported globally. And when that standard is supported globally, you'll know that in the future, if I'm building you know, this particular identity network and I have a, a decentralized identity that works on Sovereign, and on the Hyperledger, this Hyperledger technology, I want to be able to use that same identity maybe on another blockchain network. So it's very important that, that the technology that we choose is not only open source and not only uh, is, open, is run, uh, the, tr the governance model is, is run by the public, but also that it's based on open standards. Very important. So these are the, uh, the standards that right today exist. Um, this particular one, uh, decentralized uh, key management, is very exciting because this will replace the way uh, in the future when it comes to today your, your web pages get resolved with this technology called DNS, the domain name service. In the future, you're going to have uh, the same type of service that resolves these web pages. So uh, I'm not going to get too into it, but when you type in uh, Amazon.com, that's tied to a number that's tied to a server and a service, and that's how it actually functions. In the future, you're going to have these de decentralized key management systems that will be tied to a cryptographic key pair, a cryptographic proof that is more secure and better than the, the, the way the Internet works today. <clears throat> so this is, this is why uh, when we say that this is the new internet and this is coming, uh, this, is, this, this is the reason why. So this, these particular standards are going to change the world and how we transact. <clears throat> Another very important um, technology bit that, that you have to understand is that 
uh, crypto blockchains are made of three specific to mashup of three technologies. It's uh, uh, so who knows Napster? Everybody here's over 40, 30 knows what Napster is. Peer to peer networking. Uh, that is peer to peer networking technology and a bunch of math. So consensus algorithms have been around for decades. It's math, all right, and cryptography, even more math. And this is why we trust this technology. Zero knowledge proof is a type of t a technology that this is how the, the identity credentials get. So when you authenticate and you have to um, uh, prove who you are, a cryptographic proof, they're using something called zero knowledge proofs. Now I won't dive too deep into how it works, but basically it's the ability to share a secret without giving away what that secret is. All right, and it's, it may sound like you know, hocus pocus, but this capability and this particular technology is, is going to be how we authenticate and how we prove who we are without giving away the most basic information. So my European friends are always laughing about this particular use case. And they go, so let me get this straight. You go to a bar and you give a bartender your home address to prove who you are? No. So the future is going to be because of the zero knowledge proof, because you can sit there and prove, share a secret math without telling them exactly your age, you can sit there and instead of, instead of your handing them a driver's license, you'll hand them your, your, your phone and it'll be red or green. And it'll say, you know what? Because of the math, it's going to say you're over 21. You don't have to sit there and tell them exactly how old you are. You know, nobody, nobody should know. They just want to know, are you old enough? So zero knowledge proof and encryption technology and cryptography technology is one of the reasons why we chose uh, the sovereign network because this is how it should be. You know, and imagine all the different types of, uh, you know, if you want to go, um, it, it, this mass deals with ranges too. And so again, if you should never have to give all this personally identifiable information uh, to, to a bank. You know, a bank, maybe they only want to know that you're 18, all right, but really, if you're going to get a mortgage, what are those basic things that they need to know? You know, they don't need to know exactly how much money you make, they just want to know that you, that you make enough to give that. And so this technology is what hides the information and gives you just enough information to be able to authenticate your child or anybody that's on this particular network. So that's the technology, that's the, the use case. And so, and so what's next? Um, so t tonight we're actually, we're, we're, we're announcing this project. We've been, we've been in research mode. Uh, next week, uh, we've invited Sovereign. Sovereign's coming out on their dime. Uh, they like our project. Uh, they, they're sending their top chief sec uh, security architect, a guy who's actually designing their token. Now in the blockchain world and cryptocurrency, everything's driven by a token, uh, a coin. And the idea is in the future, all transactions will be driven by some kind of uh, cryptocurrency. Your, so your network device and every transaction you do on the web will have to pay for a millionth of a coin for that particular transaction to function. And that future is, is, is again, it's the, it's the basis of, of blockchain and the guy who's designing the token model for this network. And this particular token is gonna be the incentive that validators, remember I said stewards? The stewards are the nodes on the blockchain. So when Elizabeth, Liz talked about decentralization and how this works is that this is going to be a network of businesses. Davidson College, we're trying to get a meeting with Lori and, and others here to say, hey, you know what? Davidson College should, should be a steward. You know, the, the, the technical requirement to be a validator of credentials is very low, right? And all you need to do is commit a couple resources to make sure that the, the nodes are up, and that's how this functions. We're bringing them to town, and our goal is to train at least 90 to 100 developers for free. You don't need to know the, uh, be a blockchain expert. You don't need to know how to build a blockchain. All you have to do, if you know a coder or a programmer and they want to figure out just how to build an application, a decentralized application, and use this, net, this, this network, bring them out. Entrepreneurs and developers, we're inviting them. So if you know somebody, or if your kid's into programming or going to, and they want to, it, this particular technology, you just need to know JavaScript, you know, and come and learn how to build an application. This guy, he just got back from uh, two weeks in Europe. He was in Switzerland, and he's, he's agreed to come here and train us, and we have here in Charlotte, we're gonna be doing here in the hub. Uh, we've got 25 seats uh, in one of the rooms around here. Uh, in, Char in, in, in Charlotte, actually these dates are around, so Davidson's on the 4th, and then at UNCC, at the uh, UNCC city, city Center, 
we have 60 seats. So again, you might not be a developer, you might not be as excited as I am about this, but for us to, for, the, for this to become a reality, for this network to become a reality, for us to be able to protect our kids, uh, you need to, uh, we need to, the next steps are we have to build an MVP. So our goal is in the next three to six months, uh, let's learn how to build just a mobile app. Let's leverage this, this network and just build the application and show, okay, how long does it take for the transaction to process? You know, and once we do this, and also integrating a, a biometric device, and there, there's, a, there's a company called iRespond that works with Sovereign, and so we'll invest in the technology and say, all right, we want to register children, and then we want to prove that this works. And that, that part of the project is going to be, is not, not that difficult. Uh, the harder part of this particular project is, is completely not technical. It's 100% it's political. It's how do we convince the community? You know, hopefully I've maybe convinced you a little bit, that this network and this technology is the right technology to protect our kids. Um, but now we want to, we have a working group. Uh, um, Rachel is on it and saying, okay, how can maybe we create a working group of the different PTA uh, uh, people that belong to all the different PTAs and say, okay, we're going to train you a little bit on what blockchain is and why this is valuable and leverage those people. And this is why Mark says that we need good communicators, people that can, that can evangelize and convince these PTAs and these schools that when we want to come out and, and remember back in the, in the 80s when the big thing was to go and register and some of you guys aren't old enough, but when it was, all right, go to the, the local police station and get a finger printed, right? And that was a big deal. Now, we want to do the same thing, but before we show up with, a, with, you know, in a van and everybody comes out and, and gives their fingerprints, we have to convince them that it's a good idea. We have to convince them that this is better than Facebook. You know, they, this is better than Google. I have them understand why blockchain equals trust. And we're not trusting in humans. We're trusting in math. And who doesn't love that? That's the beauty of this technology. We're trusting in math, not in humans. Not that we're all evil, but that's the key element of the value proposition of this technology. So join our groups, uh, the Hyperlenser uh, Charlotte group is one, uh, uh, one of our partner groups, uh, Blockchain LKN. If you go to meetup.com slash blockchain LKN, you can, you can join. Um, and with that, uh, I'll open up to uh, questions. Let's see, uh, oh, we got a bunch. Uh, first question, could this technology be misused by governments looking to control their populations? Great question. The answer is no. So the idea is decentralization. So one of the groups that we have to convince, uh, Senator Tart is one of, the, uh, one of our, is, is on board, um, and he understands the technology. And the idea of decentralization is that you're <coughs> removing the control from any one centralized group, including governments. All right, now governments initially, when they, when they hear about this, they're like, and even businesses, they're going, well, I'm losing control. You know, the banks are going, I don't want to be a part of that. But when you see that when your customers start moving in this direction, um, this is what, uh, uh, you know, again, this is the, the whole, the difference between centralization and decentralization, uh, this is it. So the idea is, now I'm not really going to say never, but for sure, uh, the idea of blockchain and decentralization is that no government, no business is going to control us and control our, our data. Okay. Um, where's that question you scrolled? Okay, so um, I love the kid secure idea. I think it will work great for involved parents and normal families. Aren't the teens most at risk of it, uh, from a distressed family situation with lacking parental involvement? How do you intend to apply and recruit the program to those uh, most in need of the service? I'm, I'm Feel free to, of the crowd, yeah, to yeah. whoever's best to answer it. Take it. I mean, I have a thought since, um, you know, when you um, are a teacher um, and sometimes you are in that situation where you have the students that don't have parental involvement, um, but sometimes when there is no parental involvement, there's other stressors in the family life that are causing that, and sometimes those children are then in the care of a teacher because the parents can't be involved, and quite honestly, a lot of those parents wish they could be more involved, and they are counting on the school to become the source of the involvement. So that could be um, a situation in which, I'm not sure how that would work out, but I'm just in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, 
that reaching out where you're basically saying, we know you can't be involved to protect them from these things that they are at higher risk of. I think they, they are aware that their families are at higher risk of things. Their whole life is about risk. So when they hear that all it's going to take is this, not that all it's going to take, but there may be a simpler way just by the child if they are still in school for them to also have their identity on a protected blockchain. So that's just my thought on that. So. Great. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions come in. We probably won't be able to get to all of them because there's a ton. Um, uh, the minimum age requirement to ride an Uber or Lyft is 18. Is kid securing in reference to ride sharing meant to prevent children from illegally using a Lyft or Uber? Yeah, that's the whole thing. So, I mean, parents, just again, it's the way the world we live in. Even though this is a policy that Uber has, uh, there's kids all the time that that get on it. And so the idea is not to really fight Uber, is to go to them and say, hey, wouldn't you? And even like, you know, you pay for Uber, the, the XL and the luxury service. Parents, you know, I'll spend any, any, every dime I have on my kid. All right? And if I want that special Uber that the driver has been more, better verified and vetted, the idea is to offer the technology, again, in the MVP and say, hey, you know what? This is something good for Lyft or for Uber, all right? And it's not meant to uh, be a, a bad thing. It's just like if you have this policy, then at a minimum, let's authenticate them and say, hey, you can't ride because you're underage. Or you know what? Why don't we continue your revenue and let them authenticate with their parent? You know, or maybe a social worker that cares about that particular, you know, that former victim that, that's living in a, in a home. So. Okay. this conversation tonight, but she's been doing Uber. She's 14 for like three years in Chicago and here, it's never happening again, but they do not check ever. She's never been denied a ride ever. And I'm like petrified right now. Yeah. Well, and, and, yeah, and it's not, again, this, it's important too. We didn't mean to, uh, you know, and again, if Uber, you know, people aren't there, is that we're not trying to say Uber's evil and it's not, it's more of, uh, you know, the opportunity to take our kids is so easy, right? Um, and, and you can trust Uber, but what we're saying is that it's like anything, you know, can we, uh, the airport example is probably the best example, use case, is that I traveled, I took my daughter to San Francisco to see her, my parents, and all they, and I, I sat there and I just, I listened. And they only asked, how old are you? And what's your name? And she's like, I'm 13, I'm, I'm Olivia. And they didn't ask, is this your dad? That was it, you know, and that's what you should be more scared of. Right, because we're number eight. And these sex predators, they know how to put the fear of God. And, and all it takes is that one time that your kid's pissed at you. Right, so. It's one of the questions uh, I actually had as I was listening at what's a, what's like a, a stereotype of a sex trafficked person? I always imagine someone from another country brought to the US against their will. That could be completely inaccurate. I have no actual, like what's the body of trafficked people, uh, human okay, trafficking. Thanks. Yeah, yeah the, what, what, what's their, like what's a story that would be, um, you know, I heard about the nail salons around here that were yeah, rated recently as an example. That, yeah, so they're, uh, the, the, the trafficked ages are between, uh, first of all, they, they've been as young as, as eight. All right, there's a, if you, if you Google Mina's story, M-E-N-N-A, is, is an example of familial trafficking, where an uncle uh, put his uh, eight-year-old uh, niece and gave him to a uh, solder to a sex trafficker right so the the profile of the Johns you know the profile in which is disgusting and this is why we we shouldn't be proud in this one case to be Americans is that it's it's American men that are buying the white male that are are, are, are doing this to our children right they go on these uh, trips to uh, the Dominican Republic, you know, they, and, they, and they can get out. In the DR, they have a problem. They've got Russian, the Russian mob. They've got the Chinese mafia. The, Chi the mob brings in European women. The Chinese mafia brings in young Asian girls. And then, they, and then we have, you know, Americans go over there and they, they, they victimize these children. And so the, the, the age range, uh, there's, there's the, the primary ones that are trafficked are obviously the ones that are in uh, you know, poor communities, you know, homeless people, uh, if it, foster care. This is one of the things that really pisses me off. Foster care system is great. You know, I hopefully, I, hopefully I'll be able to adopt one day uh, more kids. Um, but foster care system in, in everywhere is actually, they're feeding more 
children to this t- supply chain. How does that work? Is that with, when a child fosters out, say a girl turn, turns 18, if you're in a foster care, what do you think your chances are that you're going to college? Right? They're very low. So when, when you're in the foster care system, you rank into the social mobility. And you know what social mobility is, right? We're 50 out of 50. So if you're, and, and, and so if you foster out within 48 hours of, of being out on your own, this is when the traffickers get you. And why? Because this poor person's cold. You know, because they, they want food. They want shelter. And so this is some kid that's been in a home, and now because they're 18, they have to fend for themselves, and within 48 hours, they get asked a question. And they say, hey, come on, yeah, we'll give you food, but you know, you need to do this one thing. You know, and it's just, this guy, just, you know, he's giving you all this, and that's how it starts. So it's, it pisses me off, and this is why you know, I, 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 I will do this forever. And, uh, but that's basically the, the demographic issue. Okay. Uh- I just feel like that I recently learned um, about a girl that uh, she survived being a victim of sex trafficking. She was a teenager, and actually there's a nonprofit here in Charlotte. They have like a shelter to help them, like, uh, not just um, emotionally, psychologically, but also giving it a place to stay. And so she was sharing kind of her testimonial, and they were protecting her identity. But basically what she said was that she kind of was upset at her parents, so she left her house. Um, she didn't have a place to crash, so somehow she ended up somehow uh, uh, homeless, and then this a uh, nice girl. She just approached her and he said, "Oh, you know, I I want to help you. Um, you know, I I can even buy you a pretty nice dress. Look at your clothes." And she was just so friendly and kind. So this girl didn't feel. Um, any fear of talking to this person. So they usually they use other people that they feel this teenager can trust and they are friendly or around their age. And once this uh, teenager started talking to her, she said, oh, I want to invite you to a party. And then uh, she saw all these people, uh, bigger guys, bigger people, and she said, no, you cannot escape. And then they brought her to a house that didn't have any access. And, and anyway, she was able to be free. Uh, but basically, I don't think there's like a stereotype, like you can point to it. Like any person uh, can do it for different uh, purposes or Is monetary reasons Is most of it for sex or it. am I bumping into them, you know, somebody at a random business and they're a victim that I don't realize when I'm purchasing something? So, you know, 96 million of the 150 million is sex trafficking, but a large majority is uh, labor trafficking. So what is the number one revenue business for North Carolina? Who can tell me? What is it? Not banking. It's agriculture. This is, this is what, yeah, it, well, this, this is one, and so who, who's out there? You know, do you think that all of those uh, people that are working in agriculture are just regular paid employees? No, they're illegal immigrants. A lot of them are. And unfortunately, this is what it is. A majority, we make revenue. We have agriculture as one of the major drivers for the revenue of the state, and it is based off of labor traffickers. You know, they come from other countries, these immigrants, and they're forced to work. You know, here we had that case. We had a nail salon in Davidson, you know, that I used to take my kid to, and this, they found a poor girl who was working there having to do nails because they were promised, okay, you're gonna get a visa, you're gonna get this and that, and, but you gotta work for the next 10 years for nothing, and that's how it is. So there's a lot of, labor trafficking is a big aspect of it. Sex trafficking is the nightmare, but it, the, the act of trafficking is, t- is taking a person from point A to point B and forcing them to do work against their will. Fair enough. Uh, I saw a question in the back here. Yeah. Yeah. So two weeks ago, I just got auctioned off for the first time. Uh, not that I'm worth anything, but I got I got auctioned off um, for an anti-human trafficking. We have a, a nonprofit we work with called Ursus, and uh, this individual, Tammy Harris, is raising money, and she, she's an expert on building the, uh, um, homes. You know, can we build better homes for these victims? So when a person gets trafficked, they get put into a hotel room uh, when they're they, they're saved, and that's the level of care they get. And so what this, this individual needs is mental health th- therapy. They need physical therapy. They need job skills, right? And so uh, Tammy Harris, who runs Ursus, she's got this standard. 
and people are trying to give her homes, and she's trying to raise money, and we work a lot with her, and she's the one that actually educated me on, on the human <laughs> trafficking side and the nightmare of it. But uh, for sure, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like remember the Sally Struther commercials you used to see about save the kids in Africa, give money, I think they still go. Uh, or even when you see, hey, the, the, there's a poor dog, and you wanna give money. When people talk about human trafficking and this, they, it just, it's natural to be like, okay, click. You know, I don't wanna hear about that. But it's happening here, right? And we have a ton of nonprofits that we work with. Uh, the Ursus is one of them. They're kind of our, our guiding light to, to go to. Uh, one of our projects uh, is a CRM uh, for 2019, is that um, I have a relationship with uh, the people that are at the top of salesforce.org. And um, the salesforce.org has agreed to help. Every Salesforce employee has to do 60 hours of community service at salesforce.org. So we said, well, why don't we, why don't we improve this, this survivor care network? Because they don't share, a, a nonprofit, one of the problems they have is they, they have to apply for grants and to be able to fund everything they do. And they have a real hard time doing it and they're competing for grants. So, and part of the problem is that they don't have good data. And so can we go and say, look, why don't we just implement CR, you know, Salesforce, get free licenses, you know, and, and also, you know, those records make them immutable. And, and so combine CRM and blockchain technology. And this particular project is gonna happen. Salesforce is gonna help uh, roll out the MVP for that. And, and it's just, again, it's because we know about human trafficking, we see the problem, we talk about it in our group and say, all right, what can we do next? Right. So. Um, I, one last question, uh, just uh, on the, um, on kids, are, are you limited to, and this will be the last question, uh, are you limited to uh, fingerprints, eye scans, and facial recognition? Is that kind of, are there other, what's the universe of possibilities of, uh, you know, biometric? Uh, yeah, so biometric technology, the best biometric, uh, it's not face, even though that face and the, the, the bless you. Um, the facial recognition technology is not the best, but there are, there's a facial recognition, iris, and fingerprint. These are called biomarkers. Uh, right now it's a fingerprint and, uh, and iris is actually the best. Um, so that's uh, coming. There's a company called Irispawn that works with Sovereign, and we're talking to them and seeing if they can donate some of these devices. And, uh, and again, the idea is let's build the MVP. You know, it's, you know, we invest a little bit of money of our own, but let's get that MVP built. You know, train people like, like, like Liz. Let's build this product. Let's figure out how to integrate the biometrics. And then once we have it, you know, like Mark said, there's absolutely no reason we can't spin this off to a nonprofit and, and have like a nonprofit leader like Erica and say, look, you know how to run nonprofits. Here's a technology. Run with it. Build something out of it. Go save children. Because really, at the end of the day, what's it about? It's not about saving all of them. It's saving one life, changing one life, one future of one child. That's, that's what I want. Is if I can do it one time, everything will be worth it. So. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up to me afterwards. Thanks again. Thanks guys, you guys did a great job, really informative. Um, I appreciate all the perspectives as well and I think it's um, great to point out that we do have a lot of people who are working in these groups that are non-technical people too. So um, we need everybody who has interest in these kind of topics to come and help figure out how their skills can be applicable in the group. So um, thank you all for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Um, we will be skipping December events because you all have lots of things going on in December. Um, but stay tuned for um, our schedule of events in 2019. If you were here tonight, you should be on our email list. Um, so we'll be communicating with you in the future but if you have any questions you can always reach out to me through the website um, and we can talk a little bit more thank you